Perfect. So I guess, um, do I just wait a second before I start the presentation or am I good to get into it? Um, I think you're good to get into it. Okay, awesome. Okay, so I'll just share my screen here. Okay. So uh, first off, thank you very much for joining. I know it's it's early Saturday morning and uh, it's not difficult getting out of bed on the weekend. So for anybody who's joining, thank you very much. Um, today I'll be talking about problem identification and refinement within the product development process. So I just want to give a quick sort of outline of what, what I'm going to talk about throughout the presentation. So first off, I'll go into a small introduction about who I am, sort of what my background is and, and what experience I have that really pertains to this subject. Um, next, we'll take a, a, a sort of a, a deep dive into the traditional product development process and sort of how it's transitioning as, as the product development process evolves. Um, after that, we'll look at problem identification. So this is figuring out what are the issues that we're actually trying to solve in the product development process. And we'll go through some basic steps and stages associated with that. From there, we'll look at problem refinement. So how we, we can take all that information from our, our identification and sort of boil that down into one um, concise statement that you can communicate to others. After that, we'll take a look at the solution space. So sort of that's the fun part when you're designing, building and engineering your final solution. And then we can go over some questions and answers. Uh, so throughout the talk, um, if you do have any questions, feel free to just put them in the chat and I'm sure we'll go over them when we're finished. So a little bit about myself. Um, I am a graduate of the industrial design program at Carleton University. So I graduated last year in April of 2021. Um, I'm currently a first year master's of engineering design student at McMaster University. I am studying part-time while working full-time as an industrial designer for Stance Healthcare. Um, at Stance, we design, engineer, manufacture uh, furniture for the healthcare environment. So uh, that's international business as well. So we do US, Canada, and we're sort of trying to push it into uh, other areas of, of the, the market. Uh, my experience really lies in product engineering, uh, product design, and visualization. So I have a lot of experience with CAD tools, um, sort of like Creo, SolidWorks, Fusion, as well as a lot of visualization tools such as KeyShot and then hand sketching and rendering. And then of course, on the design side, we are dealing a lot with like product conception and sort of figuring out what's the next offering we're gonna have. Um, so a few other uh, logos I have down here is, I worked with a, a small startup called My Pit Board. Um, they actually create GPS units for, um, motor, uh, for dirt bikes and motocross vehicles. So that was a cool little project I've done. And I also have the true um, hockey logo up there. And I'm happy to say in the next, next two, two weeks from now, I'll be actually moving on to work for true as a skate designer. So uh, yeah, that's kind of my background and sort of in what I do and uh, the experience that I have pertained to the subject matter. So the first thing we'll take a look at is what is product development? Um, this is something that everybody, I think they think they know what it is on some level and they have a, a general idea, but it's important to really get a good definition of this before we move on to the next, the problem identification and problem refinement, because this is your foundation. So the better you can understand product development process, the better understanding, the better, um, more well equipped you'll be to create a better solution in the end. So this is sort of my own definition of product development, um, that it is the design, engineering, and physical development of an item that serves to solve a problem experienced by a significant number of users. And I think the two keys here are that it's solving a problem and it's solving that problem for people or users. And I think a lot of the times that gets lost within the product development process. People try to boil it down to specific steps and physical tasks you have to do. But at the end of the day, this product that you're creating, whether it's, I have a physical item here, but even a digital item with the, with the whole idea of UX design and service design, you are looking to solve a problem for somebody. So it's really important to keep those things in mind throughout the entire product development process. So at the top here, um, I've outlined sort of the traditional product development process guideline. And this is something that I've seen in sort of introduction to marketing classes, even economics classes have this basic, like early engineering design classes when they sort of break it down. 
And you see a lot of variations of this, but it's essentially the same thing where you start with an idea in this model. So you have this great idea that's going to change the world in some way. And then from there, you look at the market. So what are your what are your competitors? Where would this fit in a given market? Who are you going to sell it to? So if you're trying to understand the context of your idea, from there, you'd move on to the design and engineering, which is the fun part for a lot of people. So you're coming up with different variations of your idea. You're, you're, you're you're trying different ways to engineer it and build it. And then you also get into prototyping and testing where you're actually building the physical thing. Or sometimes if it is a service design, you're building um, a web platform or a UX interface that you're able to test your idea. And from there, you usually go back and forth from prototyping and testing to design and engineering. Um, after that, you lead to a final design. This is where you figure out where we're going to build this, how we're going to build it, your supply chain, all the final specifications, like finishes, all that is, is captured in this step. And then lastly, it's commercialization. So this is obviously getting that idea out the door and into the hands of people. So it's really important to identify that this isn't necessarily wrong, but this is a solution-based process. So this entire product development process is based on your initial idea. And then that's the starting point. If you take a look at sort of the trend of, of how it's going and you look at sort of how companies are starting to come up with an idea or a little startups, they're actually basing their idea off of a problem. So I think this traditional product development process, it still holds true, but there's almost three precursor steps to improve it. And that's sort of a problem-based process. So the first thing you have to do in this is you have to actually find a problem. So you're gonna figure out what's the issue here Next is define that problem. So boil it down into a, um, a statement that you're able to deliver to people to explain to them what this, what exactly the problem is that you're trying to solve. And third is solving the problem. And what I mean by solving the problem is not actually coming up with the final solution, but it's more of an abstract way of what, what do you need to do to solve this problem? So really it, it, taking a look at the traditional product development process and overlaying this with these three precursor steps, I think will really help a lot of people in their development of products. So this is a great um, um, product development cycle, I guess, or, or timeline. And um, this is not my slide, but it's commonly, I saw it through design school many, many times. And it's really showing the breakdown of how much time you're spending in each space. And I think it's really important that you're spending almost half your time figuring out the problem before you jump into the solution. Because really that problem that you identify is gonna drive your solution. And even if you have a great solution, if you're not really solving anything, that product's kind of useless to an extent. So it's really important to, before you even get to that idea stage, you've really thoroughly understood the problem and there is in this process, it is a little bit more fluid. There's some give and take. So it's not as rigid as you move to one, you can never go back. You see there's a bit of overlap in the solution space and the problem space. And you're able to sort of cycle back and forth as you need to. It's more of an organic process. I really like this quote, and I'm sure a lot of people have heard it. Um, it's by Henry Ford uh, and, he, and sort of about the invention of the, the first automobiles. If I had asked people what they wanted, they would have said faster horses. And it's a great quote because it, it really identifies that he had a, a good understanding of what the problem people were facing. People in general who were more solution focused would have said, well, we're on a horse. We just need a, this funny, it sounds a faster horse, but he identified it as you need to be able to move from A to B faster and safely. So that's sort of how he came up with the car. And, and it's a great, it's a great example of, I hate to use this term, but out of the box thinking a little bit to be able to solve the solution in a non-linear and traditional manner. So now we'll sort of look at problem identification. So now that we've sort of identified the importance of identifying a problem, we'll, we'll actually talk about how you can do this in your sort of, in your, in your process as you're going along. So as kind of previously stated, in order to develop a successful product, you really have to identify and thoroughly understand the problem you're trying to solve. And there's really three key ways to do this. Uh, the first is to empathize. So you want to have empathy when you're trying to find a problem. So you have to put yourself in the shoes of the person or the people you are designing for. So 
people always get mixed up with empathy and they say, well, why would I need empathy when I'm developing a physical, a mechanical system or a physical product? And that's really because you're helping people at the end of the day. So it's important that you, you can understand their perspective. Uh, the second is observation. Observation is really important because a lot of the times things that seem obvious to you just thinking about them become very different when you put them under a microscope. So really it's very, very important to observe what's going on in that problem scenario that you've identified. And lastly is research. Um, obviously you want to know as much as you can about a given subject and, and research allows you to sort of build in a greater depth of information on any subject that you're trying to design or develop a product for. Um, and it provides much greater context to the problem you're trying to solve. So we'll go over empathy to sort of a little bit more in detail. So this is the ability to understand and share the feelings of another. So products, like I said before, they're meant to be used by people. So even if you're developing a mechanical system, it's either going to serve somebody or it's going to be used directly by that person. So really, people always get mixed up with this. You do have to have empathy and have to be able to understand the experience that they're going through. And if you can understand the feelings and the frustrations and the pitfalls and the problems that a person is experiencing, you're going to be better equipped as the designer or the engineer to develop a, sol a solution that fits them better. So really having empathy throughout the entire process is fantastic. Always look always look at, at what you're seeing and what you're designing for through an empathetic lens, which is very, very important. So observation, to perceive, to notice or perceive something and register it as being significant. So a lot of the times people think that these great ideas sort of come out of thin air, out of the blue or out of some um, innate ability of creativity. And I think a lot of the time that's, that's false. A lot of the time it comes out of just keenly observing. You really do have an advantage when you observe and you observe specific details because a lot of the times the solution is it's quite obvious. It's right in front of you. And really what I mean by taking a keen observation is even if you think I know how that process goes, I've done this a million times, I know what it's like. If you step back and objectively look at the situation, you can identify quite easily where those problems exist, the the inception of those problems, and sort of it sometimes becomes quite obvious to you how you can solve the problem. So observation is such a powerful tool that people don't give enough, don't I think utilize enough or credit themselves enough with when they're developing a new product. Really observing, being a keen observer will give you so much information. A lot of times can lead to important insights that will help your solution. Uh, research, as I'm sure many of us know, uh, the systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions. So I think we we're living in an unprecedented time right now where we have so much access to information um, and essentially free access. So we need to take advantage of that. Um, I really like the quote that we stand on the shoulders of giants. So there's this large body of work that's been conducted painstakingly a lot of the times by other people. And we can access that information so quickly through secondary research. And that's going to give us such a deep knowledge of a subject so quickly. And it really is going to provide that context that we need. So it's, I find in, in this, in today's world, it's so easy to become an expert or at least to, to improve your knowledge on something so quickly. So, that's a critical part of it too. You don't have to go out and necessarily reinvent the wheel or identify concepts that have already been established. All you have to do is sort of seek them out and that's gonna help you when you're developing and you're figuring out your problem. So now, now that you've sort of done those three things, you've, you've empathized throughout the process, you've observed and you've researched, you have sort of all these ideas in your head of, okay, I, I can't, I'm kind of getting this blurry picture of what this problem is that I'm looking like. But especially in today's world, it's really important to be able to boil that problem down and communicate it to everybody else. So now we're going to, and this is the, the stage of problem refinement that we're in. So like I said, you need to be able to define your problem clearly, concisely, and convincingly in order to communicate it to others and ultimately to guide your solution. Um, so really when you're defining your problem, 
Like I said, you have all this information that's swirling in. There's three things that you need to get down in your problem to make it convincing. And sometimes a, a few aspects of this will change, but ultimately you're going to have these three factors within that one or two sentence statement. So the first thing that you're going to need to identify is your end user or your end user. So who who is this solution for? Who's who's experienced this problem and who needs help in the form of a product? The second is, what's the need? What have you what have you identified as the thing that needs to change for this problem to go away or to be resolved? And lastly is why. Excuse me. So what information can you provide me to tell me that this is a, a real problem and it absolutely needs to be solved? So we'll look at, at the user first. So who is facing the problem that you are solving? Um, if you want to create a really viable solution and sort of um, the most effective solution, you need to understand the key characteristics of your end user. Um, a lot of the times people create fake user profiles. So they'll have like a picture, they'll have statistics on sort of um, race, gender, a day to day, like sort of what their schedule is, what their experience is. And it'll give you a breakdown of sort of the profile of who you're designing for. And this can really... Uh, influence sort of your ultimate, your final solution from an aesthetic, functional, and even a commercialization standpoint where, you know, if you're designing for little kids, this problem, this solution probably needs to be smaller and ergonomically correct for them, where if it's for an adult, it has to be different. And even visually, if it's a kid, maybe it can be more playful and brighter colors, where it's adult, you might want it to be more uh, inconspicuous and um, uh, sort of classically uh, design in terms of it's nothing that's jumping out in your face. So darker, more subdued colors. Um, the next is, is the need. So what they need to be able to solve this problem. And this one, I think people have a lot of trouble with, but you, you don't want to explain this as a physical item. It's kind of sometimes an abstract idea or an action. So like, like I said, your common needs are you need safety, speed, comfort, even pleasure can be in this, um, in this definition or or even you need more time so really boil it down to the the essence of what the solution is going to provide for this user and it, it's not at this point you're not identifying a thing you're identifying what this thing will do for them or what's what how is this going to fill a need that they have to solve this problem so lastly you're going to identify why so what reason or insight can you provide to demonstrate that the problem is valid? So this is a great opportunity to sum up all this empathetic research and observation that you did and really convince me. So sell me on this idea, like sell me on this problem. Like I need to know why this is such a big deal and why we need to go through all the trouble of creating a product to solve it. Um, so you want to do this as simple and as straightforward as possible. You only have people's attention for sometimes it's less than a minute. And how can you deliver your most important and most convincing piece of information quickly? So it's almost kind of like think about it as your elevator pitch in this scenario. You're breaking it down to your most important, the most important insight or takeaway you had from, from that previous problem identification uh, stage. So when we boil this down, um, it's again the end user, the need, and the why. You're going to put those together and you're going to get a refined problem statement. Um, so here's a, an example one that I've done, and this is sort of, you don't have to follow this necessarily like to a T, but I think it's got the three elements in the recipe that you need for every good problem statement. So here, McMaster University students need to access safe and affordable transportation to campus because 35% of the student population lives over five kilometers away and has limited financial resources that prevent them from owning a car. So in this statement, I feel like I've identified all three of these important concepts. So the end user, it's, you know, right off the bat, it's McMaster University students. And this can change. It can be broad or more specific, depending on the problem you're trying to solve. But I've identified this is who I'm developing the solution for. The next is the need. And I've identified a need for safe and affordable transportation. So that's gonna play a huge role in my solution because now I've identified the keys 
within my that I need my product to have to be able to solve this problem. So again, it's an ab, an abstract concept of affordable and safe. I'm not I'm not identifying the final solution yet. And lastly, I'm providing a reason. Well, this is a problem and they need this because 35% of students they live far away and they don't have the money to be able to own a vehicle, which is your traditional mode of transportation. So I, I've, and this is one sentence, and I can say this quickly, I can say this in 30 seconds to anybody and they should be able to grasp it. So this is a great way to really think of boiling it down, getting those three most important pieces communicated across to somebody. Uh, and last we'll go into the fun stuff, which is solution space. And this is obviously, if you're an engineering or design student, this is sort of where you you live and sort of your, your expertise. And uh, uh, yeah, we'll sort of talk about how this, how this meshes with the product development, with the problem identification and refining process. Um, so I'm not sure if um, you've seen this model before, but this is sort of a, um, I saw this many times for design school, it's a basic model of, of uh, product development and, and from product inception into the, your final product. Um, so again, like we talked about, there's almost an equal share of time finding out the problem and figuring out the solution. So that's again, really important to get across that you want to spend as much time on your solution, on your problem as you do on your solution to make sure it's, it's the right, you're solving the right problem. So like we talked about at the start, you're going to diverge. You're going to do your research, you're going to discover, you're going to observe, you're going to find out all this wonderful information about your project, about, about the problem that you sort of have an idea about. And then you're going to define that and boil it down into that one statement. And then that statement is so important because I see where that red dot is. Your ideas for your solution begin with the definition of your problem. So that's why it's so important to curate a sound problem because that's going to drive your solution. As we said before, if I go back, I've identified safe and affordable transportation. So when I go to design, I'm going to look at, okay, my solution has to be safe and affordable and provide transportation. So right there, that problem statement has told me the three keys I need to hit in order to create a good, viable, effective solution. So that's why it's so critical to have that problem statement concise. But from that, then you're going to take that idea and those three concepts and you're going to run with a bunch of ideas and concepts and you're going to then you're going to apply your your skills in building different solutions and then once you sort of reach a point where i have all these ideas you're going to refine it down in the delivery section to one final solution and again this process isn't necessarily perfect but it's uh um, it is a very effective way to uh, harbor creativity out of a problem. So it's, uh, I think it, it's, it's an effective way to, um, to develop products more so than the traditional solution-based model. Um, so thank you very much. Um, for those of you who listen, um, if you want to go over any sort of questions and, and answer, I think now would be uh, the time period. So uh, I hope that made a little bit of sense of what I was talking about. And uh, yeah, thank you very much. I'll just start sharing my screen. Perfect. Um, I can actually get started with a question of my own. So um, in my courses, I actually do a lot of this uh, design process thinking and a yeah. lot of the things that you mentioned, like the Stanford design model that you showed, uh, like I actually learned about that and try to implement it. One of the projects mm -hmm. is like going to a hospital uh, and need finding over there and observing trying to figure out some sort of um, problem or some way to improve the workflow and yep. then implementing that. From my experience, it's usually a really long process. Like we can't finish a project within a year. Mm -hmm. And students now at a design have to do all this in a weekend. So how would you, what tips would you give to students with problem identification for this really short-term project? So that, that's, that's a great point. I think this short-term project is great when you compare it with um industry because industry and time is everything so you can't like although it's nice to be able to take a year and do this really deep dive and research everything you can't so this is where you want to try to boil it down by using that secondary research so that's a great way to come in and say okay i can't take two days observing everything but what i can do is i can with that empathetic lens i can do research and i can say like i said we have the internet 
the information that we have access to is is almost unlimited. So go on the internet, research what you're trying to find in your given period of time and do as much as you can and try to get yourself down at least two or three important um, keys to your solution. So I think that's a great question because you're right, you don't have forever to do this. But on a weekend like this, I would say the first thing you want to do is spend that two, three hours you have because it'll pay off in your solution. If you spend a little bit more time up front in the two, three hours, do research online. If you can do some quick observations, see somebody walking around, do that. But this is where you really want to leverage um, the secondary research that's already available out there. Perfect. Thank you. I'm just opening it up to anyone else who's watching. If you have any questions, you can use the chat feature in Hopin. Type in your question and um, yeah, I will ask it to Anthony. Perfect. Yeah, I think we still have a few more minutes, so don't mind hanging out. I actually have another question when it comes to testing. So say once you develop your first iteration of a solution, mm -hmm. how would you go about testing and showing it to those end users? Are there any specifically testing protocols that you would implement specifically for your time like Stance Healthcare? Yeah, so a lot of the times like what we're looking for is ergonomic testing. So um, a lot of that is a qualitative, which I know some people don't love as much because it is a little bit more, it's obviously subjective, but we'll try to use the people around us because we're trying to move quickly. So we'll use our office staff, and our production staff, and we'll get them to sit test the chair that we're working on and get, and they'll give some feedback. So that's that whole, that uh, prototype validation research. There's a whole um, really depth of knowledge in that field, but I always like to say with a prototype, if you're not if you're not I, finding out something about your solution, it's been a waste of time. So all you're trying to do with a prototype is validate your design and your idea. So I really think quickly getting even leveraging people around you, and if you can't necessarily get it into your end environment, trying to simulate that quickly um, is the best way to do it. Because obviously, in like I said, in real life, time and resources is a constraint. So you want to try to, um, as best as you can, um, do that quickly with the tools that you have. Even um, talking about in CAD systems, we actually have CAD maquettes, so little models that we're able to put into our chairs on our CAD system that can really um, help us a lot with, is this ergonomically correct right off the bat or do we need to make changes before we even physically test it? Okay, that's interesting. With those small miniature CAD models, I assume that they're they don't use the actual materials that your actual product would have as well, right? So, um, so we we do. There are some. Um, what we usually use it for is um, if we do furniture that's developed out of plastic, where there's really no compliance in the material, it's pretty much solid. Those are what they're good for because obviously when you have foam on chairs and you need to see how you'll actually yeah well, we we can't we can't test that but that's a limitation to it so we again we're going to use this where we can in the process and even these CAD uh, models they have anthropometric data that they take the information from so we're able to identify okay 50th percentile uh, female North America and we can put that that user into the chair so it's a great way to quickly go through a bunch of different people. A uh, bunch of different sides and see how they'll, they'll sort of fit up. Okay, that's cool. That's cool. It gives you an uh, easy way to get a lot of data that you can evaluate. Yeah, right. And that's why I said like prototyping to me is people people always think of prototyping going out in a machine shop and welding things together or like three <laughs> D printing. And mm -hmm. people got to step back and think the reason you prototype is to validate your idea. Sometimes it can be done with paper or on your computer, and if it, if if that's all it takes, there's no reason in, in wasting your time and effort that way. So yeah. That's really cool. Yeah. Um, even for like my projects in particular, like we would always get actual people to test. We would go out to like expos to uh, have people try our product just to get data, but using like a model that that's an interesting approach. Yeah. And, and I think it's, it's good to have a mix of both. Like I, I totally, I, I am big on the physical side. I always want to validate it physically, but like I said, like if when we're on a tight schedule and we need it 
sooner rather than later, you have to find ways to be able to validate your idea. And I mean, everybody, there's so many free CAD systems out there and so many great programs uh, virtually that it's only becoming easier and easier. Mm, definitely, definitely. Perfect. So yeah, it looks like we're we're coming up to our third, at the end of our time now. Um, is there is there anything else you really want to go over here? Um, no, that is all the questions I had. Perfect. Uh, well, I don't know who was watching, but if anybody uh, wants to contact me, uh, feel free. And if you want to see a copy of the presentation, I'm, I'm more than happy to send it over. So um, thank you very much and uh, enjoy the competition. Thank you for joining us, Anthony. Perfect. Thanks.